I'm happy to welcome you to another week of our four-and-a-half-year verse-by-verse journey through all of God's inspired Word. We are currently in the book of Esther, so if you'll find your place there, we'll start in chapter 2, verse 5 in just a moment. In what we've already looked at, we know that the great Persian Empire is stretching from the foot of the Himalayas in the territory of the Indian subcontinent in the east all the way down to Egypt and Ethiopia in the south, uh, up into the area of Mesopotamia, and then westward into what we call modern-day Turkey. The emperor is currently a man that the book of Esther calls Ahasuerus, but which we are also referring to as Xerxes I. Xerxes' father had intended to extend or expand the empire westward into the Greek home islands and home mainland, but he never got that done. So when Xerxes comes to power, almost immediately he starts preparing the people for this idea of going that direction. And he has this great big half-year party that is described in chapter number one. And then we also are introduced to his wife, Vashti, one of many, but she is the chief advisor, I guess you would say. She is the main mover on the feminine side of the empire. She's very, very powerful. She has her own party, her own banquet, in which she is no doubt uh, encouraging all the women to go along with this plan to send their husbands and sons and brothers off to the glory of the expansion of the empire. But then Xerxes makes this fatal mistake of insisting that Queen Vashti come and just show herself off in the male uh, banquet time, and she refuses. And because Xerxes is in his cups, as it used to be said, he's, he's a little bit uh, inebriated, he becomes angry, and he talks to his advisors, and they blow this all out of proportion, saying, that this will be a breakdown of the Medo-Persian society. All the women will quit cooperating with their husbands and everything's going to fall apart. And so the only solution they could think of is Ashti has to be made an example of. She has to be punished with exile. So Xerxes does so. And all of that happened right around 483 B.C., But three years later, in the sixth year of Xerxes, he starts missing Vashti. Not just the companionship of a wife, but rather also her wisdom and her ability to move things within the empire, especially on the feminine side of the scale. And so Xerxes can't bring her back. So he decides, with the advice of his counselors, to find somebody like her. Now, it is clear that there's no one among the other wives that can hold a candle to the former queen. So that's who he's looking for in this this pageant, sometimes referred to, uh, of having all the young unattached women uh, to be evaluated and the top of the top, the cream of the crop, are then going to be brought into the king's haram, into the king's uh, group of wives, and the top one of those top ones will be the new Vashti, the new chief wife. And so we, at this point, will recap the introduction of the woman who will be that queen. 
Esther chapter 2, verse 5 says, Now there was a Jew in Susa the citadel. So this is the, the main city of Xerxes' kingdom, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair, son of Shemai, son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Yaconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. So we have the genealogy here of, uh, of Mordecai, and his great-grandfather had been taken into Babylonian exile, and that means that Mordecai had actually grown up in Babylon. He's not known anything else. But he also has a ward that he is taking care of. Uh, now, he doesn't seem to have a family of his own, and I believe that's related to the fact that he is a member of the palace staff and probably a eunuch. Uh, he probably voluntarily gave up his own familial rights, uh, the ability to get married and have a family, in order to serve the empire. And so, he, though, has a daughter that is adopted that came from his own family. Verse 7, he was bringing up Hadassah. Hadassah is the Hebrew name. It means myrtle, like the myrtle plant. Uh, and uh, as is very often common, there are multiple names that are given. And so her other name here is Esther. Now, Esther is the idea of a star, and it's related to the fact that the myrtle plant has star-shaped, five-lobed, basically, flowers. And so, she is the flower. That's what her mom and dad named her. She's the myrtle flower. And so, she is the daughter of his uncle. That means she's his cousin, younger than him, obviously, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at, which is playing into the idea that she will be very prominent amongst those in the pageant, the contest that's coming up. And when her mother, her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her in as his own daughter. And so when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. So our guess is she must have been in her later teens. She had not yet been betrothed to anyone else. Mordecai was probably being very picky about who he was going to marry his, uh, his daughter, his adoptive daughter too, uh, but also God's hand is here. She is going to end up being God's pre-placed secret weapon for saving the Jewish people. And so he has taken charge of her, has not married her off, has not engaged her, and so she is going to be one of those young women brought into this evaluation process. So, uh, the young woman pleased him, as in Haggai, and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the haram. Uh, haram here is a much more modern word from the Middle Eastern uh, idea. Uh, the literalness here is the, the house of the women. So this is the female dormitory uh, in the palace complex. And the women who go through this process at this stage are going to become secondary wives to the king, Xerxes. But only one of them is going to end up becoming the new chief wife, the female advisor to the crown. 
And Haggai has already started backing Esther for that win. He sees that she is stunningly more wise and more put together, and yes, also beautiful than any of the other women. And so he starts helping her out to make sure she wins in the selection process. Now pay attention to this, verse number 10. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. Now when we first started this book, I told you that the context of the time has some anti-Jewish sentiment rising up within the empire. It started down near Jerusalem uh, when some of the non-Israeli peoples of that region objected to the return of ethnic Israelis to their homeland under Cyrus, to the rebuilding of their temple, and to the reestablishment of their, their culture in that land. And they have been lodging official legal complaints against them repeatedly. And so that's all in the pipeline there in Susa, there in the capital city. And Mordecai is well aware that it's not just legal challenges, there are also bad, bad attitudes among powerful people against Jews, against ethnic Israelis. So he had simply instructed his young daughter, don't reveal that you are ethnically Israeli. Don't let anybody know you're Jewish. Just keep that under your hat. Make it private. Uh, this would not have been that hard because this is a this is a time when there are so many different cultures and ethnic groups inside the empire, and the capital city would have been just completely overrun with a wide variety of uh, ethnic uh, looks and sounds. And nobody would have probably paid too much attention to which particular group you came from unless you made a big deal out of it. And especially for someone like Esther, who was born and grew up in Susa. So she has the Susa accent. She's a Susa girl. That's her hometown. And so that's how she presents herself. She is a Persian Now, verse 11, every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem, the house of the women, to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. So she is in this year-long process of being trained in how to act in court and also getting all of this attention that will bring her to her physical peak. Uh, It's beauty treatments, but there's also some physical uh, activities, no doubt, uh, to really make her look good. Uh, And maybe learning different languages, learning different uh, customs, because it should not be forgotten that what is being evaluated here is how will this woman do when she is representing the interests of the crown to everybody, particularly the women, in the empire, and an empire that is made up of all these different groups. So she has to be a well-rounded character. and So that's probably part of the year-long process as well. So all year long, Mordecai, who apparently works in the palace, stops by at the house of the women, at the gate, at the door, and checks in on his adopted daughter. Verse number 12. Now, when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, 
since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh, six months with spices and ointments for women. When the young women went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the haram to the king's palace. Now we're talking about the finals here. It was a long process to get to the semifinalists. The semifinalists are now in the haram. They're now in the house of women. They're in the palace. And they've gone through 12 months of beautifying treatments and uh, education as to how to act as chief wife if they were to get to that place. So I don't know how many women these are, but it is not hundreds of them. Uh, It's probably a handful, maybe a dozen or so. And Esther is one of them. And what happens for the final in the selection process is they get married to King Xerxes and he evaluates every aspect of their character and life. And that would, yes, include having a sexual relationship with her to seal the marriage. So every last one of these women are going to end up being wives or concubines in the palace. That's a guarantee. Uh, The question, though, is which one of them will win the final position of chief wife, chief female advisor in the palace. And so they are given the opportunity before having that night with the king to take whatever they want. And there's been a lot of... um, a lot of commentary, a lot of of entertainment media uh, that picks up on this idea of the one night with the king, and and maybe some of them did musical stuff. Maybe some of them uh, were able to show their prowess in in playing strategic games. Whatever it is, each woman made their own choice. Now, what did what did she do? Well, verse number 14. Um, In the evening, this is again the, the women in general. In the evening she would go in. In the morning she would return to the second haram in custody of Sha'agash, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. So they go from one house which was set up for these un yet unmarried women. They're going to move now to the other house where all of the wives of Xerxes and also the previous kings, because they would have also been uh, in the haram, are housed. And uh, that means they're married now. Uh, She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. That becomes interesting to the plot later. Once this marriage happened, then the only time that you were going to be as the wife with the king again is if the king asked for you specifically. Now, that is a weird thing to all of us who uh, are married and love our spouses and would never want uh, to have anyone else in the equation, and, and we want to have freedom of, of approach and all of that, that it seems very strange. But remember that particularly with kings, marriages were often about alliances. And so they were not about love. Love would sometimes enter into the picture. But they were chiefly about power and authority and influence. If you would like the closest thing, I think, in our modern society to the role of these women uh, in their society would be like ambassadors, where uh, an ambassador goes to a country to enter into an intimate relationship with the leaders of that country. 
and to advise them about how to interact with their home country and to advise their home country how to interact with uh, their host country. Uh, And so that's, I think, the closest thing that we can get in understanding the power and influence of these women. And so the king is only going to interact with those that have the greatest power and influence that he is trying to engage with. Now, verse 15. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, now that's birth dad, uh, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai the king's eunuch who had charge of the women advised. Now we have zero understanding of what that was. But remember that Haggai is backing Esther. And he has himself intimate, probably long-term, many, many, many years knowledge of what King Xerxes is like. It is very possible that Haggai is old enough that he has watched Xerxes grow up and interacted with him when he was younger, before he ever became the king. Uh, It is possible that Haggai knows Xerxes' birth mom very well. If she is alive, then uh, Haggai, uh, as one of the king's eunuchs, would have had interaction with her at different times in her life. So he knows Xerxes and gives Esther some inside information. This is what I think you should take. Now, Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Let's not pass over that. Everybody is rooting for her. Probably even some of the other women are looking at her and saying, you, you're it. You're going to be the one that will succeed uh, in the midst of this, and you deserve it. Verse number 16. When Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. Now, that's the time where we actually have uh, a an anchor point in history. And so the 10th month, in this case, would have fallen in the very beginning of December, uh, the the first day of the 10th month. So we're just basically talking about December in this particular year. So December of 480 BC, that's when this event happens. And the king loved Esther more than all the women. So everybody else that was on the short list, the semifinal list, they fall away in his estimation. They, they fade into insignificance once he meets her. And she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So spending that night with her, having conversations with her, hearing her wisdom, hearing her her take on things, persuaded him that he should make her the new chief wife. And so he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. And he also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. So he is all excited that he has now got that that chief wife again that he can trust and that he uh, knows will look out for the interests of the kingdom. And he even declares some um, rebates of taxes or the scroll back, rollback of taxes 
for the provinces to celebrate this new wife, and he gave gifts all over the place. At this point, we need to bring in the secular history that we know about. Because before uh, the end of the Jewish year, before the end of the Mesopotamian year uh, that we're looking at here, and we were already in the 10th month, remember, before the end of the year, Xerxes leaves his palace at Susa and marches off to Sardis. Yes, the Sardis, that's one of the seven cities mentioned in the book of Revelation. It's off in the western end of modern-day Turkey. He marches off to Susa because he's getting ready to invade the homelands of the Greeks. So the replacement of this wife, this chief wife, happens in close proximity to the big event in the early part of his reign, which is we are going to expand the empire even farther west. Now, unfortunately for him, that's not the way it played out. Because by a year later, he is returning home with only about half of his men and a portion of his equipment. Uh, Some of the records indicate that he took a million men and thousands of ships and equipment uh, against the Greek homelands, and he was defeated. Uh, This is the context in which the Battle of Thermopylae, hot gates, happened, where the Spartans held off and killed tens of thousands of Persians to keep them from invading their homeland. It's Xerxes who got his clock cleaned in that ill-fated invasion of Greece, and then he came home. 